you have a Bible, I would invite you to turn to Mark chapter 16. We'll be looking at the passage that I read earlier. And as we come to God's Word, may we remember that heaven and earth may pass away, but not one jot or tittle of His Word will pass away. May we remember that it was through the spoken Word that Jesus put the stars in creation, and that He upholds the universe by the Word of His power. It is His Word that creates life where there is no life. It is His Word that creates faith where there is no faith. It is His Word that builds the church and establishes the church. And it is His Word who will come for His bride, the incarnate Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here this morning for our uh, resurrection service. We are reminded each Easter season that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed as we've already proclaimed together. Of course, we celebrate uh, our Lord's resurrection each and every Sunday. But this is a unique time of year where we can especially give honor and adoration to Him. We love Christmas as well, Easter and Christmas. And uh, we think about the incarnation, the birth of Jesus Christ. But in some ways, I'm beginning to like Easter a little bit more. Um, the reason Jesus came or was born in the first place, obviously, is that He would, so that He would die for sinners that He would give His life as a ransom for many, and that He would redeem a people who would worship Him and enjoy Him forever. We had a wonderful time Friday night with uh, Cornerstone Bible Fellowship and Grace Church in North Olmstead as we had a combined service for Good Friday where we, we read Scripture, we sang together, and um, we preached on the Last Supper, Jesus in the, the Garden of Gethsemane and the Crucifixion. Uh, I believe the Gospel is lifted up and the cross was proclaimed by God's grace, uh, we understand that without the cross, there would be no atonement for sin. And so we preach the cross. There would be no salvation, and heaven would be empty, and hell would be full. Yes, we glory in the cross, but the cross is not the end of the story. Amen? We don't meet for worship on Friday. We, we, we meet for worship on Sunday. Precisely because it was the first day of the week when we call the Lord's Day, in which... Our Savior rose from the grave. So I begin by making the emphasis that the resurrection is central to the story of redemption. It's not a secondary, a secondary issue. It, it, is not, uh, it is not to be marginalized, as many would do. It is not to be marginalized, as we see in much of evangelistic methods, where it is completely forgotten or ignored. The resurrection should dominate our theme in praise and worship, for it is the source of eternal life with God. Because He lives, we will also live. Without the resurrection, the cross would be meaningless. Without the resurrection, the cross would be powerless to affect anything. Without the resurrection, we would still be dead in our sins. Our friends and relatives would be in hell. Our hope would be in vain. Our preaching is useless, and we are seen as fools if Christ was not raised from the dead. But, indeed, Christ was raised from the dead. He is raised from the dead. Because the resurrection is so important, it's a major theme in the New Testament, and we find it recorded in, in all four Gospels this first Easter Sunday. If we were to bring all the Gospels together, it would create this great harmony of the events surrounding Jesus rising from the grave. I've titled my message this morning, Evidences for the Resurrection. And if we were trying to give evidence for the resurrection, then we would have to look at what Scripture teaches and admit that there's really nothing written about how the resurrection happens. Really, there's nothing really written about what takes place inside the grave. It, it just happens. What we read about is the events surrounding it. What we read about is the events leading up to it and the response of those following it. But we don't have a, a glimpse inside to see the supernatural phenomena, if you know what I'm trying to say. We simply know that Jesus was raised from the dead. We know that God raised him from the dead. It is supernatural. But we don't know exactly what happened. Now, if you want to give it evidence for it, as I said, we can't really look inside the cave and see the supernatural evidence, so we have to look at everything that's going on around the tomb. We have to look at everything that is surrounding them in the, in the natural realm, the response of peoples, the, the things that can be seen and touched, and things that can be discerned and recorded. 
the things that are observable, these evidences throughout history that we see that point as evidence of the resurrection. All four Gospels tell the marvelous story with amazing harmony because Scripture has one divine author. For example, all four Gospels record that Jesus died. For the Romans knew how to kill people. There's no mistake in other theories that he was simply asleep. He was killed on the cross in Calvary. They give testimony, the Romans do, the fact that he was truly dead. All four Gospels record that he was buried. There's no question about it. He was buried on Friday, and then he was buried in a tomb. The tomb was sealed with a stone, and the tomb was guarded by Romans. They all tell us, however, that on Sunday the tomb, the stone was removed from the tomb, and the guards had vanished. The tomb was empty. The angels explained what had happened, and then Christ began to appear to his followers, first to the women, then the disciples, and then to hundreds. They all tell the same story, all the Gospels. So, as I attempt to give you evidences for the resurrection this morning, I'm not doing so as a comprehensive apologetic or, or some kind of exhaustive means. I'm simply looking at this text that is before us in Mark 16 and, and pulling out things that, that point to the resurrection. Of course, we know that no one will believe apart from the intervening work of God through His Holy Spirit into the hearts of people. But regardless, we have, we have evidence, we have uh, events, we have circumstances, we have people, we have places, we have things. And so my goal here is, if you're a Christian, is to strengthen you. To strengthen you in your resolve to live for the, the Lord because He lives. My aim for the non-Christian, as always, is that God would open your hearts to these truths. That you would embrace Christ by faith and trust in His death and resurrection for your eternal life. That's always our aim. And so as we look at the passage together, I want to highlight it into four headings of evidences of the resurrection. Number one, evidence of the resurrection is the Lord's day. Worship on the Lord's day. Look at verse one with me. When the Sabbath had passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. Now, if it were not for the resurrection, we would not be here today. If we're not for the resurrection, we would maybe be gathering on some other day or not gathering at all. Because for centuries, the day of worship had been the seventh day, the Sabbath. It had been the Sabbath virtually every since creation. Ever since God finished his wonderful work of creation and entered into his rest and ordained the Sabbath. But from the resurrection Sunday on, the Sabbath is no longer necessary because as believers, we rest in Christ. We know the Lord is the Lord of the Sabbath. And, and we therefore don't honor certain days. As Colossians 2.16 says, Let no one pass judgment on you in response to food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. The, the Sabbath is no longer binding for us as a day of worship, the seventh day of the week. What we find in Scripture is that the church was born on the first day of the week. What we find is the church was established on the Lord's Day. You go into the book of Acts and you find the church meeting on the first day of the week. You go to 1 Corinthians and the church in chapter 16 is meeting on the first day of the week. You study Revelation like we're doing on Wednesday night. You know that John was caught up in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. Now, I make this emphasis because this was a huge shift for the early church. It was a huge shift for humanity in general, for, for religion in general. Most of the believers in the early church had Jewish backgrounds. And the Sabbath was absolutely ingrained into their thinking to the point that Jesus violating the Sabbath caused the Jewish people at that time to want to kill him. That's how serious they were about the Sabbath. So to make this change from the seventh day to the first day for those who had encountered Jesus Christ was a monumental shift. It's almost unexplainable. It was a shift in the course of history. So what happened to make this monumental change? Well, we know what happened. Pentecost happened. We understand that at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the church was born. 
And let me remind you, the church was not born on the basis of, of the philosophy of Jesus as a wonderful moral teacher who went around doing good. The church was not made up of a group of people who wanted to start a new way of living. We're just sick of, sick of living the old way. It wasn't made up of people who shared common interests. The church was born less than two months after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it consisted of a group of people who had one thing in common. They had seen the risen Savior. That is what they had in common. That explains the monumental shift in their faith, in their understanding, in their lifestyle. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, they became witnesses and preached boldly in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outer parts of the world. And Peter, in his inaugural sermon, he told the people what they needed to know in order to be saved, what they needed to embrace, what they needed to, 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 to believe from the heart. And if you listen closely, what I think you will hear here is the latest techniques for drawing a crowd to your church on Easter. No, I'm being facetious. I'm being sarcastic. You will learn in Peter's sermon what you need to do in order to take your church to the next level of growth. No, Chris, you're being snarky now. If we could just capture what worked for the early church, we, would, we could hold conferences and workshops around the world to build bigger and better churches for the kingdom of God. What is this secret technique? Let's read Acts chapter 2, verse 22. I'll have it, I think it's on the screen for you. Men of Israel, Peter says, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, it's pretty obvious to everyone, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed at the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. A few verses later, Peter says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all a witness. As a result of implementing this one church growth technique, 3,000 people came to faith and joined the church that day. After hearing Peter's testimony, the rulers and the priests in Jerusalem, well, they put him on trial. So even facing the wrath of the justice system of that time and facing impending death, persecution, imprisonment, whatever, listen to what Peter said, very seeker-friendly. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Now, why would the early church be willing to suffer and die for a lie if Christ had not been raised? What was the amazing strategy that Peter implemented? He was telling people that this Jesus who was crucified is now alive. That was the message then. It's been the message for 2,000 years of the church, and it is the message today. Now think with me for a moment. Peter wasn't just preaching this message of a resur resurrected Lord in some remote, remote location where nobody knew about Jesus where no one had heard of him. He preached this message in the heart of Jerusalem, where everybody knew Jesus was tried, crucified, and buried. And no one would be stupid enough to believe Peter's message if Jesus was still in the tomb, because they could just simply go over there and look. All they'd have to do is look, and the sham would be up. And I would submit to you that the church would not have started in Jerusalem unless it was an established fact that the tomb was empty. My second point. The Lord's Day, worship, the empty tomb. The empty tomb is evidence. It's very early on the first day of the week, the very day that Jesus said he would rise from the dead, and Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought, they bought spices so they might come and anoint him. Now these are women who were with Jesus throughout his ministry. They were there at the triumphal entry. They were there when he taught in the temple. They helped him prepare the Passover. They, unlike the male disciples who scattered, were at the cross. They were there when Joseph of Arimathea laid him in the tomb. And they were the first ones to arrive at the tomb on the first day of the week. Look at Mark 15. Just back up a few verses and, and notice with me. In verse 46, Joseph, 
He bought a linen shroud and taking Jesus down from the cross, wrapped him in a linen shroud and laid him in the tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. They saw it. They knew. And so they bought spices. They came the first day of the week not to prepare his body for burial. He had already been prepared. Joseph had enough means to do that. I believe they came to, to one last time pay homage to their master and their Lord. They did not come expecting that the tomb would be empty. Look at verse 3. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They're thinking, how are we going to get to him? How are we going to be able to see him? How can we anoint him with these spices? How can we worship him and, and pay honor and respect to him one last time? How, how are we going to be able to do that when the stone is rolled in front of the grave? Because they saw all this happen. Now you remember, don't you, that Pilate had been given permission, he gave permission to seal the tomb because they knew what Jesus said, that he would rise from the grave on the third day. They all knew he was proclaiming that this would happen. And so they were thinking the disciples would come and steal the body. So Pilate gave permission to seal up the tomb so that they would not come and steal the body of Jesus and say to the people, he is risen from the dead and the last deception would be worse than the first. As I was reading through this, one commentator said something that just struck me. He said, isn't it interesting that the unbelieving Jews and unbelieving Romans were more convinced of a fake resurrection than the disciples were of a real one? I mean, if this was a sham that was trying to be pulled off by the early Christians, they did a horrible job. They did not expect the tomb to be empty. Throughout his ministry, they did not understand when he said, Son of man must go up to Jerusalem, be tried, and be handed over to the chief priest, and be crucified, and then what? On the third day, rise again. He said it time and time again. Well, the women were not expecting that he would be gone. They were wondering who would roll the stone away so that they can anoint Jesus. Now, they didn't know the Roman guards were appointed there to guard it. By the way, these, these were the best. These were the elite. It's not as if a few weak disciples could overpower Roman guards and steal the body. These women didn't know that there was an earthquake. We read that in Matthew's account. We read that in other accounts. They didn't know the stone was rolled away. They didn't know that the angels appeared. All they know is Joseph placed his body in the grave, and now he's gone. Now Luke adds that Mary perhaps thought someone had taken the body or stolen the body. So his disciples... We're not trying to masquerade and pull off this charade of a, of a resurrection. The women didn't know where the body was. The Jewish leaders didn't know where his body was. They thought the disciples were going to steal it. The disciples probably perhaps thought that the Jewish leaders stole his body. The Roman guards didn't take it because they ran in fear of the angels. And they went back to the authorities and told the authorities what happened. And they came up with a plan. What they said was, we'll tell them that the disciples stole them. They're all pointing fingers at each other, but no one knows where Jesus is. Oh, we'll tell them that the disciples came in the middle of the night and stole them. Never mind the fact that if they failed at their duty, they could be executed. If they failed to guard against the disciples stealing his body, they would be executed. So they went back and came up with a plan. We'll just tell them that they stole the body. And they paid the soldiers off to stick to the story. And the text says that the story was widely spread amongst the Jews, even to that day. The unbelieving Jews, the disciples, took his body. No one could produce his body. No one knew where he was. And no one since has been able to produce the body of Jesus Christ. The tomb is empty. There is no, uh, there is no monument. Um, Think of the word. There's no consecrated spot. They're not even sure to this day exactly where his tomb was. It was customary practice in that day to, to set up a monument to the saints. They don't know. Where is he? We know. We know where he is, right? The evidence is of the Lord's resurrection. The Lord's day, the empty tomb, and number three, the angel's proclamation. Proclamation. 
Verse 4, And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Now Luke gives an account of two angels here. There's no real contradiction, if only in our minds. The women saw the angel, and as usual, they were alarmed. All throughout Scripture, those who have an encounter with angels are, are struck with fear. That's the usual response to angels. And the angel speaks to them in verse 6. He says to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Now Luke fills in this account a little bit more in Luke 24, verse 5. And they were frightened, and they bowed their faces to the ground. And the men, the angels, said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? I just love that. He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. It's not as if Jesus did not say this over and over and over and over again. Unbelievable. So we have the angel's proclamation. You're like, well, okay, what does that have to do with anything? Let me just remind you of the angel's involvement in the prophecy of Christ. The angel's involvement in the announcement of the birth of Christ. The angels that protected Jesus as a baby. The angels that ministered to him at the start of his public ministry all the way to the end. When Christ comes for his church, angels will be involved. They will be with him at a second coming. They will judge unbelievers and Satan. It was angels that delivered the law to Moses through God. What, am I trying to, what point am I trying to make? I'm trying to make, trying to say this. They're here to proclaim that he is risen and to deny the resurrection and to deny the historical reality of the empty tomb is to deny the heavenly messengers of God himself. It is to deny the very Father who sent the messengers. These aren't ordinary individuals who are given testimony. These are holy angels. Evidences for the resurrection, Lord's Day, the empty tomb, the angel's proclamation, number four, the eyewitnesses. Now there's other evidences throughout Scripture. I'm just talking about what's in the text. I pray that you will go home and read these things and see if they're true, the things that I'm saying. In verse 7, the eyewitnesses. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They were afraid. They had left the tomb. They were told by the angels what to do. They were given instructions and a promise. He will meet you there. You will see him. And in Matthew's account, it wasn't long. As we see in chapter 28, verse 9, Behold, Jesus met them. The angels said they'll see him. They saw Jesus. Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and they will see me there. These angels, they're acting on God's behalf to give instructions and a promise. Go tell Peter and the others that Jesus is going to Galilee just like he said he would. Now, I didn't put this in my notes, but I asked myself this. How many times does the Lord have to say something before I understand and believe it? Time and time again, he said what would happen, and it happened according to his word. While on the way, Jesus appears to the women. To the women. Amazing. Know anything about Greco-Roman culture? The testimony of women meant nothing. It meant nothing. If we are going to concoct some story about a superhero, we would not bring the women of the culture forward in order to give a first account testimony. That would be unheard of. In Jewish circles, it would take two women to testify against one man. One man's word was as good as two women. If someone wanted to invent a story about Jesus being raised, they wouldn't choose the women to be the first witnesses. By the way, that very night, Jesus also met some of his disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. That very night, he met some of the disciples in the upper room. He appeared to Peter, restored him to service. Do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? After the denials. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul testifies that he appeared to 500 people. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, we read, He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. Unbelievable. 
as followers of Christ, as, as members of the church, as believers, we, we, should be, we should be satisfied with God's word alone. God's word speaks of this. We believe his word is sufficient. It is authoritative. It is inerrant. It is, it is without an error. But we understand that apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, no one's going to believe this. No one is going to believe God's word. Now, these are just a few of the evidences throughout Scripture of the resurrection. Think about it. Worship on the Lord's day. The empty tomb. There's still no explanation for it. I'm just waiting for one of those TV movie producers to, you know, remember they, they found King Tut's tomb, right? Who was the other guy, uh, the gangster? They found his, uh, who's the gangster from Chicago? Nobody knows anyways. Didn't they find his, his uh, safe or something? Didn't they have all these things on TV where they're going to find all these wonderful things? They, they, they found the Titanic. They find this. They find that. When are they going to have a show about finding the grave of Jesus and finding the bones? Just produce the evidence and the whole thing would be up. But here we are, more than 2,000 years later, meeting on this day, much to the fact that it is April Fool's Day, and we look like fools to the rest of the world. But we would rather be fools for Christ, wouldn't we? Than be accepted by the world. And we understand the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. They cannot produce Jesus. Just bring him out. Just show us where he is. Of course, I'm Googling stuff. In this Shroud of Turin business. I'll talk about that later. I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's a bunch of, you know, seriously. That's supposed to prove something. I saw one place where a woman, you know, she saw Jesus on a taco shell. You know, and everybody's seeing Jesus. Like, that's the best you got? We have the authoritative word. We have the promise that came out of the risen Savior's mouth himself. I will be crucified, buried, and rise again on the third day. It is that message, brothers and sisters, by which we are saved. No one who's convinced of these things intellectually is going to be saved. No amount of arguing with somebody over the resurrection is going to lead them to Christ. We must get to the gospel. We must preach that if they'll confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. Remember Philippians 2? That Jesus didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself. He took on the form of a bondservant. He was made in the likeness of men. He became obedient, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee under the earth, above the earth, shall bow and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. If you confess Jesus is Lord, if you're willing to submit to him as Lord of your life and turn from your sins and turn to trusting in him, you will be saved. No one's going to save by no one's going to get saved by believing intellectually these things. You have to believe it with all of your heart. You remember Jesus at uh, the funeral for Lazarus and performs this miracle and well if you were here Jesus he wouldn't have died and after all it's the fourth day and he's starting to stink and you know so next thing you know Jesus alright you know he wept because of what his friend died nah because of their unbelief and with his word with the word of his power his mouth he says to Lazarus come out come out that is a symbol of spiritual life God calls us to come out of spiritual death come into the light to trust in him and he says I'm the resurrection and the life anyone believes in me he will live even if he what dies and he says this do you believe this I just ask you the same question do you believe this one last thing I think the greatest testimony of the resurrection as I said already is that we are here today and for many of us I pray all of us our lives have been dramatically changed. There is no other explanation for you and your life save the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no explanation for my life why I would be here proclaiming God's word. We're here today. We worship Christ on the first day of the week because it's the Lord's day. In fact, in our life, every day is the Lord's day. And the church militant will be the church triumphant. Why? Because of the resurrection. We will be like him. And by the way, all throughout the Old Testament, believers of old, 
who are truly saved believe that they would see Him. That is the hope of every Christian. They will see the Lord. Because Jesus has risen, the fear of death is gone, the hope of glory is ours. He conquers the grave and promises that anyone who will receive Him in saving faith will be saved. I think you, brothers and sisters, are the greatest evidence of the resurrection. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, now to you, we say with the writer of Hebrews, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, Equip us with every good that we may do your will, Heavenly Father. Work in us, O Lord, that which is pleasing in your sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. We're dismissed. Amen.